Uh, there is absolutely no time for break here. So uh, let's go on with uh, the next session. And uh, I will uh, myself uh, give the first talk. Uh, so let's see how this will work. So uh, I'm from the Tata Biocenter, and I will just give you a brief introduction of who we are. So the Tata Biocenter is, uh, there are two of them, uh, one in uh, Sweden and one in the uh, Czech Republic, and we do have offices in California and in uh, Germany. Uh, we are essentially a training uh, provider in uh, molecular diagnostics, and in particular in uh, real-time PCR. Uh, we are uh, uh, also one of Europe's largest service provider for companies, hospitals, and say design, validation, and analysis of molecular <coughs> samples. And uh, essentially, the reason that how we have developed is that we work very, very close with essentially all the instrument providers in the field. So our labs are very well equipped. We have over 20 different uh, real-time PCI instruments, robotics and you name it, uh, all uh, systems for uh, designing experiments and analyzing data. And we also welcome students and uh, postdocs to come to our lab and use it as a core facility. It's uh, very attractive and you are supported and through us you are supported by the instrument manufacturers. So <coughs> this is, uh, uh, we also have our own uh, product development. In fact, quite a few of the products we use today were in somehow uh, co-developed or validated by us because we work very close with many of the leading companies. Uh, we are very uh, keen on uh, quality control because uh, one of the issues, and I think it has been realized also uh, during this conference and pointed out by several of the previous speakers, it's quality. We are doing quite challenging analysis and it's easy to go wrong and particularly uh, uh, many inexperienced labs uh, get quite frequently the impression, particularly perhaps from the sales reps, that things are much easier than they are in, in real life. And uh, essentially, a couple of years back, we, together with uh, some colleagues, a few of them are here, and uh, Michael Pfaffel, I believe tomorrow, will be talking only about that. We presented essentially uh, guidelines, recommendations, and what you should test in order uh, to validate that your, the results you generate are reliable and also that information should be provided when you submit papers for publication. And today, I think it's about 20 journals actually request that data are compliant with the MIKE guidelines to be accepted for publication. Uh, this was just brought in uh, Nature, and uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, stories there about problems caused by poor qPCR data. Uh, we are also involved in a uh, quite important European effort. Uh, I don't know if somebody will be talking about it here, hopefully. Uh, there was a talk about that in, in, uh, yesterday in, in Barcelona. It's a European effort aiming to standardize uh, the pre analytical process, that is what happens from the point of sampling until the actual analysis. And uh, uh, with uh, a number of colleagues, uh, we did uh, ring trials. Samples were collected in Florence, in Italy. Maybe that's why Mario is not here, because they took all his blood, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then they distributed the blood samples across some 200 laboratories in, in Europe and asked them to do something that may sound trivial, just purify the RNA and then send it back, and uh, the Florence lab tested the quality. And in a sense, what they found was that about 30% of European routine laboratories have serious issues purifying RNA from blood. That's quite serious because these labs are delivering reports uh, to the clinicians, and based on that, decisions are made. Uh, we are certified lab by the ISO, and uh, the SPDR project attracted the interest of ISO, and now there is a working group uh, that is uh, drafting a new set of guidelines for the pre analytical process, and we expect those to be in force end of this year. Anyhow, that was a brief introduction, so let's talk about single cells. Well, the first and most important question is, of course, why do we do single cell? Why bother? 
And I think it's illustrated quite neatly by this uh, uh, graph here showing the island of Langehans, which is uh, stained for the delta cells. This is the same islet stained for alpha cells, and here we have the islet stained also for beta cells. These cells, that three very, very different cell types, they respond to different stimuli, they express different genes, and of course, if you analyze the entire islet, or even if you cut a piece of it, you will get the collective response of all the cells because the islet is a mosaic. If you really want to understand the response of the different cell types, we really need to go down to the single cell level. And that's essentially what attracted us. And actually, <coughs> uh, so many, many, many years ago, uh, one of my students actually visited Birgit Liss, who gave a talk earlier. She was in Oxford then doing postdoc. And together, essentially, they start doing single cell work. So these data are pretty old. But what we did in our lab, using essentially the patch clamp technique to aspirate a cytoplasm from the cells, we analyze the large number of individual cells. These are beta cells, and this is also cell line, min 6 cell line, for the expression, in this case, insulin 1. We got brilliant data, but we also found a great heterogeneity. There is a very, very large variation among the number of transcripts, insulin transcripts, among the different beta cells in that cell line. And that also turned out to be the case when we isolated them from uh, islands of Langehans. So, <clears throat> and uh, we are a little puzzled. This is a graph just showing uh, some of the statistics. Uh, it's a frequency diagram, essentially showing that out of the cells we analyzed, this happens to be beta actin expression instead, 40 cells had between 0 and 100 transcript, 25 had 100 and 200 transcript, some 14. 200 and 300 and so forth. What is striking is that most cells have very, very few transcripts. And then there are a few cells that have a very, very large number of transcripts. Taking these data and just plotted them was another scale. Same data as in the previous graph. The difference is that this scale is now log scale, showing the log of the beta actin. When the data are plotted in log scale, you see that they can actually be modeled quite neatly with a normal distribution. And essentially, this indicates that uh, transcripts among like cells show a log normal distribution. And since, uh, uh, since our finding uh, almost 10 years ago, this has been shown for virtually any transcript in any kind of cell. So this seems to be more or less a general phenomenon of cells. I know actually of only one exception myself, and that's oocytes, but because they don't have any RNA metabolism. There may be more, but this is what we usually observe. And it does have a number of consequences, because <clears throat> if you're interested in, uh, for example, determining how many transcripts do we have in a typical cell of a population, how do we do that? Well, if we take if you study a regular normal sample containing a million that cells, we measure the total amount of transcripts and we divide by the number of cells, well, this is how we calculate the average number of transcripts per cell. But this is known as the arithmetic average, and that number will only be uh, the number of transcripts in a typical cell if the underlying distribution is normal in the regular linear scale, but that's not the case for cells. Because of the log normal distribution we observed, the number of transcripts in the typical cell is actually given by the geometric average, and unfortunately that cannot be determined in a classical experiment. The only way to determine the geometric average, that is the number of transcripts in a typical cell, is by performing single cell profiling. I guess you found that kind of confusing. Well, you are not alone. This is how nature summarized uh, our findings. So we confuse some more people. Uh, anyhow, why do we all work from here? Uh, so of course, the question is then, what is the reason? What is the reason uh, that we do have this log normal distribution? 
Well, <clears throat> we know that, but those data were not, uh, that was not demonstrated by us. It was in uh, several other groups. These data are from Jonathan Chubb's lab, who was one of the first that uh, did those studies. And I will actually show it uh, in, in a, a, a showing a movie from his lab. Hopefully it will start. Yes, it does start. What you see here is a cell, and uh, uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization is used to visualize the transcripts. And what you see is, uh, is a movie over time, and you see that uh, the intensity goes up and that it disappears again, clearly showing that the number of transcripts in the live cell changes over time. It's not constant. And uh, doing uh, just obs from these observations, it was seen that this is roughly how the number of transcripts vary over time. We have bursts. Suddenly, uh, the number of transcripts in the cell increases rapidly, and then they decay. And then you have a new burst and a decay, and so forth. And if you integrate these bursts, you end up with a distribution that actually is a gamma distribution but it can be pretty neatly uh, approximated with the log normal distribution, which is essentially what we observed in our experiments. The time scale of these bursts, they seem to de depend on, they vary with cell type, they depend on the gene, but they seem to be of the order of 10 minutes to perhaps an hour at most, and likewise, that's the duration of the pulses. Notably, our colleagues doing similar kind of experiments in protein expression, they also find uh, burst kinetics and log, log normal distribution for proteins. So it's nothing that is seen only for mRNA. It's absolutely seen for proteins as well. Notably, the time scales, at least as reported in literature today, are much longer for proteins. The uh, uh, pulse intervals seems to be hours up to perhaps days. The, the reason they are different, we don't know yet. <coughs> uh, even in our first study, we could measure more than one gene per cell. We measured five transcripts per cell. They are shown here, insulin one, insulin two, and we measured one reference gene or potential reference genes. We don't use reference genes today. We didn't know that at that time, and two ion channels. And if we measure five <coughs> genes per cell, we can do a quite interesting analysis because we can look at the correlation. We can test if the genes are expressed at the same time in the same cell. And the correlation is calculated by calculating a correlation coefficient, which is a number between minus 1 and 1. A, a value close to 1 indicates that the two genes are expressed at the same time in the same cell. A value around 0 means they are expressed independently of each other and a negative value would indicate that when one gene is expressed, the other one is not. Looking at the data, we only found one high correlation, and that correlation was very high. Notably, it's a correlation between the expression of insulin 1 and insulin 2. This is mouse model. Uh, mice have two insulin genes. Uh, so uh, this shows that in the beta cells, the two insulin genes are transcribed at the same time, so the bursts are correlated. Interestingly, the two insulin genes are located to different chromosomes. So there must be a mechanism for the cell to synchronize the transcription of genes on independent chromosomes. There is quite some data today indicating the nature of these mechanisms, suggesting it's actually a localization process, but that's, again, separate. Anyhow, uh, it was nice measuring five genes per beta cell, but we wanted to move forward. And then <clears throat> together in, in several uh, collaborations, we worked out the workflow uh, that, in, at least in our hands, is pretty robust today. Essentially, starting with cell collection, uh, we have uh, had a few uh, slides earlier today about the different methods. Today, we mainly use facts. Uh, we uh, have de developed a reagent for direct lysis, which means the cell is uh, dropped into a t test tube with this lysis buffer. The cell is lysed, and the reagent is compatible with RT-PCR. So we don't need to do any washing, which means that there are no losses in the workflow. 
We have a highly optimized reverse transcript, uh, uh, transcription reaction, and then we perform preamplification. The reason we prefer, perform preamplification is that if you want to analyze many genes per cell, well, we, we have a problem, at least if you want to do that in a single plex measurements, because then we have to take the content from a single cell and divide it into, let's say, 100 aliquots to al analyze each aliquot for one transcript. If, uh, in order to have a reliable measurement, QPC, or actually any kind of measurement, uh, starting with, uh, from a test tube, that test tube actually has to contain at least 35 target molecules, roughly. And the reason is that if it contains less, then actually the noise due to Poisson distribution, sampling noise, gets too high. It has nothing to do with the technique. It's the sampling that will cause such high noise. So if you want to analyze 100 transcripts starting from a single cell and you need to divide it into 100 aliquots, well, you wouldn't need to have 35 times 100, that is 3,500 transcripts to start with. And most cells won't have that, if nothing else, because of the underlying log normal distribution. For most transcripts, almost all transcripts, most of the cells will not have that many will not have not, not that many copies. So therefore, <clears throat> what we do is that we introduce a preamplification step. In our hands, for single cell work, it turned out that a parallel PCR worked best. So essentially, we mix uh, primers for the targets we are interested in. We run PCR, but we run it for a limited number of cycles only to make sure the reagents or the reactions do not compete for the reagents. It's very, very important. The preamplification is uh, works well, and it's validated. One of the most critical things is to have highly, highly optimized qPCR assays. We actually spend a lot, a lot of time optimizing our assays. This is just a plot showing how how we typically validate the performance of the assays. Then we also validate the preamp, and that's also pretty straightforward. Essentially, what we do is that we start with a test sample, typically a representative. CDNA sample, and we analyze uh, the, the samples either directly or via preamp. We do it for all the uh, transcripts, and then we compare uh, the uh, uh, CQ values or the amount that we measure with and without preamp. And in a sense, if the preamp works fine and there is no bias in it, we would expect all the different uh, bars to be at the same level. Uh, they are not. Uh, some are off, like here, here, here. And that indicates that there is a bias in, for those assays. However, a bias is actually not particularly serious in those kind of analysis because it will cancel when we do the calculations. In fact, we are already relying on the bias not being important because we are not, com uh, none of us, I would say, is really uh, <coughs> correcting for a bias in the reverse transcription. And we, our lab has studied that uh, and published it. The, the uh, yields in, re, in the reverse transcription can actually be very more than 200-fold among the different transcripts. 200-fold, not 200%, 200-fold. However, it doesn't matter as long as things are reproducible because when we are comparing samples, the bias will cancel. So that's not important. But, so what really matters is whether we have a reproducibility here. And, is, and the reproducibility is calculated from the replicate. So we can absolutely test for reproducibility. And doing that, it's actually only one single assay here that had to be trashed or can redesigned, actually, in this case. Um, in order to get statistics, you have to analyze a pretty large number of cells, typically hundreds or more. And if you analyze hundreds of transcripts, well, that's many qPCR reactions, and you have to work with high-throughput platforms. We use either the Quant Studio from LifeTech or Thermo today, or the Biomark from Fluidine. Uh, a speaker earlier this morning pointed out uh, that there may be an issue with uh, genomic DNA, so I actually added this slide here. I think it's quite illustrative. And one point I wanted to say is that actually, <clears throat> even though many uh, 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 company representatives will tell you that you avoid genomic DNA contamination by designing assays across introns, that is usually not true. 
And the reason is that uh, about 15% of human genes have pseudogenes. And about 50% of the pseudogenes are, they don't have introns because the pseudogenes are copies of transcripts formed by retrotransposons, transposons And those are amplified even with intron spanning primers. You can't avoid that. And there may be many pseudogenes per active gene. GAP-TH, for example, in humans is pres present in 70 copies, the pseudogene. In mice, I think it's over 300. So there may be a significant genomic DNA background, even in single cells. As Birgit uh, Liss uh, said earlier this morning, uh, one way to test or control for genomic DNA background is to do RT negative controls. You can absolutely do that according to the Mikey guidelines. The RT negative should be five cycles above the positive sample. That's great, but it's expensive, particularly if you want to run 10,000 reactions as we do. That bothers us. So <clears throat> we developed a strategy how to compensate for genomic DNA background and keep the cost down. And this we do using an assay we call valid prime. A valid prime is an assay that amplifies specifically the genomic DNA, but it's not targeting a gene. So it's not amplifying cDNA. It targets a genomic sequence that is conserved and present in exactly one copy per genome. And then all samples are analyzed with a valid prime. So we are essentially measuring genomic DNA background. That is not sufficient for compensation, but the valid prime kit also contains a genomic DNA standard. So, that, so all our assays are then tested on the genomic DNA standard, and this will tell us how sensitive are the assays, that is your assays, the assays you have developed for genomic DNA. And this will depend on whether you have intron spanning, primers or not, or, uh, and also the number of, of pseudogenes. You don't know, you just measure it. And from those extra measurements and those extra measurements, you can compensate for the genomic DNA background in all your samples. For a large study, you save 95% of the cost because you measure M plus N controls instead of M times N controls, which is necessary in regular RT negatives. Oh, that was just a comment. This is published, and this is how you compensate for it. Then we use uh, multivariate methods for analysis, typically in pathway analysis. I will show you an example. The system I will be describing now is, is a study of astrocytes, and uh, we use mice models, and uh, the astrocytes express green fluorescent proteins. So we can collect the astrocytes from mice brain uh, by faxing. And what we have done here, or rather our collaborators have done, is that they've in, in, induced a focal cerebral ischemia, that is brain damage, and we are monitoring how the astrocytes are reacting to that, essentially how the brain is trying to uh, repair the damage. These are just some data plotting uh, the frequency diagrams showing the number of transcripts that we have in different cells. As before, you see that they have a kind of log normal distribution, it's always log scale here. Or, well, if you look closer, not here. This is not a log normal distribution. There are two peaks here. And if we enlarge that, you can clearly see that there are actually two different log normal distributions. This happened to be Vimington. What this tells us is that this population of astrocytes is not homogeneous. There must be at least two different, I will use the word types because I don't, <clears throat> but I will be a little careful with that because we have not defined cell types, if you recall, it's difficult. But anyhow, there are two different groups of, of astrocytes here. And <clears throat> when you have two different groups of cells, you can start comparing them. You can do statistics, t-test, plot differential expression, you can do nice volcano plots. Great, but not particularly useful. And the reason is that, first of all, if we measure the expression of a very large number of genes, then the statistics will be shaky because there will be very large risk of having false positives there accidentally. Secondly, we don't expect the genes to uh, be activated independently of each other because that's not how biology works. 
And if we analyze data with using a regular t-test, we are analyzing the genes one, one by one. And in fact, we do assume they are independent of each other, which they are not. There are much more powerful methods to analyze data that actually exploit correlation. And one of the most uh, powerful, we saw it earlier, is, is, is principal component analysis. And uh, I will illustrate how that works. <coughs> Okay, uh, what I do is that I will do a dynamic PCA because I, I need to do it on the computer because it's a three-dimensional plot. Uh, so this plot here shows the astrocytes. So uh, every ring here is that's actually one cell, but it's, it's a plot. So it's 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 a drawn. Uh, 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 spheres, and the spheres are positioned in a three-dimensional coordinate system uh, reflecting the expression of, of the genes. Uh, we have seen these PCA plots before, but what is important when you do this kind of analysis is that typically we are measuring the activation here of astrocytes as a function of time, and the color coding shows time. So blue uh, are astrocytes collected just after the induction of, or before actually the induction of brain trauma, time zero. Uh, uh, yellow are, uh, sorry, green are three days after trauma, yellow seven days after trauma, and red are 14 days after trauma. The axis or mathematical linear combination of the expression of the different genes that separates or really emphasize the time development. And uh, the analysis here is based on, on uh, 47 genes. But what actually happens is that most of the genes are not really important because they are not responding to the trauma. And therefore, one can use a filter, essentially a filter based on variance. So what I'm do no doing now is that I'm removing genes from the analysis, genes that do not change expression over time. And by doing that, I will actually improve uh, the PCA analysis. And if I can do that quickly just now interactively, you see that there is a perfect separation between the red and the rest. And the red are uh, reactive astrocytes. That is how they have changed expression during the 14 days after the trauma. And furthermore, if I use a slider here to, to actually indicate the clusters even more clear, you see that there are actually two types of reactive astrocytes. Not only that I do change the profiles of the astrocytes, I get two different types as you, because of the, or in response to the trauma. And <clears throat> those tools are really handy because you do, you do improve the analysis or rather the, the uh, resolution greatly by essentially throwing away the genes that are not contributing. And this is just a plot uh, uh, indicating the genes that became active uh, as a function of time during the activation of the astrocytes. It's the same data as before, it's just shown in a two-dimensional plot. Uh, correlation. So what we do here it's the same thing as we did for the beta cells, but now we have 47 genes. We're looking at correlations, uh, looking for genes that are active at the same time in the same cell. And the correlation is indicated in green. Dark green means that the correlation is significant at 99% confidence. 95 is light green. And you see there are blocks. This is just one set of all the data. And the blocks indicates the genes that show correlated expression. And they have, these genes are then expected, I would think at least, to be part of the same expression networks or pathways because when, they, <clears throat> when, when we have a stimuli here, well, in this case brain trauma, they are activated, but they are activated synchronously. However, one has to be careful with just interpreting uh, the correlation coefficients. And this is illustrated here because if we have three genes, it could be that there is a master gene here that somehow triggers the expression of two other genes. 
and that will lead to an indirect correlation between these two genes, although they don't have any direct interaction. It could be that gene A somehow triggers gene B, which triggers gene C, or there may be a correlation between, or, or they may be interacting all of those. To illustrate the phenomenon, or to exemplify that, I will use actually an analogy. I will use an analogy actually from a Swedish newspaper some, some 20, 25 years ago. It was a journalist uh, in, in Sweden, and he became interested in what, how uh, hot weather changes what we do during summer. And he found that during summer, when the weather is hot, we eat more ice cream. Okay? And then he also looked at the statistics of drowning, and he actually found when the weather is hot, there are more drowning accidents. So he published on the first page in Swedish newspaper a, a theory that eating ice cream causes drowning. Okay? All right. I don't think we believe in that, but there was obviously a correlation here. And this is the same thing when we analyze the genes. If we really want to find the mechanism behind it, we have to get rid of those accidental or indirect correlations. And that can be done by a so-called partial correlation analysis. Essentially, if we know these are correlated, we can easily calculate the, interaction, uh, the correlation we expect to be here, then we subtract it and see if there's some, anything significant left. That's how it's done. And doing that, we could, in, <clears throat> we could identify expression pathways or networks of genes that become activated in the same cell, in the same astrocyte cell, of course, in this case, as response of trauma. And this is pretty cool. Uh, pathway analysis is hot today it's because a lot of pharma companies are interested in that and there are many groups doing enormous efforts in statistics on that. And they are struggling with enormous data sets because if you work with classical samples and you, uh, <laughs> you uh, apply a stimuli, you will be affecting thousands, ten thousands of genes. Here on single cell level, everything break, go, breaks down in much smaller pieces of information. It's so much easier to identify expression pathway on single cell level because we, we only see those that are active in the same cell. Well, this was just brought up in science. Anyhow, <clears throat> uh, can we go beyond a single cell, by the way? I mean, I know this is a single cell conference, or maybe it's not, but I hope I am allowed to go beyond a single cell. This is a single cell. It's a big cell. It's an oocyte. The nice thing about oocyte, this is an oocyte from a frog, is that the two halves of the oocyte have different stain, which means that I can take the oocyte and embed it and cut it in a cryostat. And if I do that, so I slice the oocyte, I can measure intracellular mRNA profiles. And that's what we have here. So these are in mRNA profiles from one side of the cell to the other. And look how they agree for the different transcripts. The transcripts, they're not in the middle of the cell, by the way. They're a little bit towards the animal pole. And in fact, that's where we expect the cell nucle uh, the nuclei to be, because it's not perfectly in the middle. But look, we found another group of transcripts on the other side of the cell. They are here. And notably, we found a few transcripts more or less exclusively is the, in the last 15th segment of the cell. So these transcripts have to be almost associated with a cell membrane. I can skip. Uh, this is, we just validated it was digital PCR, but uh, I will not. This is just a digital PCR validation. But since we are short of time, I will not talk about digital PCR. But anyhow, it has a few consequences related to cell division. They're quite interesting. This is the oocyte, and we know how it divides. That has been known for a long time. This is how it divides. And the gradient that we are measuring is along that line. So the two uh, daughter cells here are not affected by the gradient. They can still be identical. This is the second cell division. Still, the four blastomers can be identical because this is the gradient. But at the third cell division, they will be different. 
But the nice, cool thing about it is that this was predestined. The asymmetry was there already in the original oil site. It planned to divide asymmetrically. It's a clever guy, huh? This is just showing some raw data <clears throat> uh, measured on the fluid ion instrument. They are nice. 10,000 data curves here. You can spend quite some time looking at those. But why do I, why, why do I show raw data? What's, what, what's, what's special about those? I mean, there are, I think, close to 1,000 biomark instruments out there today. The special thing about these data is we are not measuring mRNA. We are not measuring microRNA, not DNA. We are measuring proteins. So how are we doing that? Well, we are doing that using a technology developed at the Swedish company Olink. And what they have done is that they have, <coughs> uh, they have identified pair, pairs of antibodies that have been tagged with DNA oligomers. And the oligomers are <laughs> complementary at the three prime ends. And they are complementary such that if they get a chance to hybridize, they will actually prime a PCR reaction. So we can form a PCR product and detect it by, by, by qPCR. But they will only come close if they are bound to protein, because the binding of the two antibodies brings them in proximity. And uh, today, uh, together with Olink, uh, uh, we have panels, panels of 96 uh, assays uh, measuring protein expression. Essentially, we analyze one microliter of crude sample, such as serum, plasma lysate. And uh, there is a panel for oncology, one for cardiovascular, and there is one for inflammation coming out. And since I heard David was here, I have to show these data as well. These data were uh, generated by a colleague of mine, Anders Stolberg, together with David here. And essentially what they did was that they, they took a single cell, they divided that single cell into a few aliquots, and the aliquots were analyzed for RNA separately, DNA, and protein. So this is the first time mRNA, microRNA, long known coding RNA, DNA, and protein was assayed in the same cell. And that, of course, uh, <clears throat> opens for the possibility to look at correlations between DNA, RNA, and microRNA levels in the same cell. The reason DNA varies, I should stress that, is that this is a construct. So we use plasmid uh, to, to, uh, that we're coding for, for, for a transcript uh, uh, to essentially uh, uh, activate everything. So therefore, we do, uh, we do have a correlation with the DNA level. And indeed, we found pretty nice correlations between DNA, mRNA, and protein levels in the cell. We found also some positive correlations with certain uh, microRNAs. And notably, for the first time, we actually found a negative correlation. Uh, we don't really understand the biology behind it, and, uh, but, but it's, it's quite interesting. And I'm, I'm really not surprised that we should have negative correlation. There will be. I mean, one, one gene may may suppress the expression of another gene, although this is a co negative correlation was actually the DNA plasma, but that's another thing. Anyhow, that's what I wanted to share with you. These are some of our collaborators and partners, <laughs> and uh, I'd be happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you. One question. I have a question relative to the Olink technology you just uh, showed us. Do you co can you comment the stability of the DS DNA, uh, so single-stranded DNA attached to the antibodies? Is it stable? How stable it is? How, uh, we've never lost it. No, I mean, no. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, to it's lose very, it, I have no doubt. It's more degradation. No, no, no. Well, it, it's, it's, it's very stable. There are actually a few different ways how to conjugate uh, DNAs to antibodies. They have developed over time. And in fact, before starting working with Olink, uh, we were working with immuno uh, PCR. So we have been doing uh, DNA conjugation to antibodies for quite a long time. If you're unlucky, you may be attaching the DNA to part of the antibody that will actually uh, 
inter interfere with the binding of the antibody. That absolutely happens. You have to validate it. But once you have uh, conjugated it and once you have purified it, I can tell you at least some of the constructs we have done or we manufactured for, let's say, seven years ago, they still work very well. But whether that holds for all antibodies and all oligos, I can't really tell. But we have very good experience out of, of stability of these constructs. Um, maybe you could explain a little bit more for my naive understanding um, the advantages of your pathway analysis by correlation. Usually when people do these pathway analysis, they, they start by generating differential gene lists and then they look into these genea, G, GCA gene banks and check whether this is enriched. Now what would be the the advantage of your approach. Yeah. I, I, was, I was not full, cl fully clear on that. Actually, when I use, said that we use, typically use pathway analysis, we do, but I didn't refer to the correlation analysis, pathway analysis. The pathway analysis we do is typically going to ingenuity database and trying to identify or correlate with the known pathways. However, uh, the uh, correlation analysis we do is rather, I would rather call it a network analysis because it's rather a network. The genes do not necessarily have to be in the same pathway. But I should say that uh, currently we don't really know what causes the correlation because the only thing we know is the correlation means that the genes are on at the same time at the same cell. And, and they are not con constituently uh, expressed. None of these genes are. Most of the cells are blank. And then suddenly this cell has a lot of transcript, but it happens to have also the other transcript there. So there must be some underlying interaction there. But I wouldn't really call it traditional pathway analysis because I think rather we are breaking some new ground here. I know there are a few statistical groups out there that have started to become interested in that. We are not really experts more than we, we use pretty basic statistics like correlation analysis and partial correlation analysis. And the, the uh, uh, the pass or the, the networks we draw, it's actually very simple. It's just connect, connect, connectivities uh, are drawn uh, when the correlation after compensation for the indirect correlation is more than, is significant. That's essentially how we draw them. So it's really no big science behind it. It's pretty straightforward, but it seems very, very powerful. That's the thing. Thank you.